Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 362. Today we're talking to Sean Gabb, who is director of the Libertarian Alliance based in the UK. Sean is the author of many books, including six historical novels under the name Richard Blake. He holds a PhD in political and intellectual history from the University of Middlesex, and he currently resides in Kent. I thought we could talk about uh, subjects like uh, Margaret Thatcher and being a libertarian in Britain and all kinds of related subjects. I don't have enough Europeans on the show, and I'm doing my best to rectify that. So here we go, my conversation with Sean Gabb. Hope you enjoy it. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. I'm very pleased to be on it. You have been involved in libertarianism for quite a while, and you're inv- you're uh, associated with the Libertarian Alliance, and we're linking to that at tomwoods.com slash 362. And uh, not too long ago, I had Toby Baxendale on the show, and I talked to him as an entrepreneur uh, I, about his experiences and his ideological transformation and his education and how it, he how he came to be who he is today. I wonder if I can do the same thing with you, particularly because I don't have as many Europeans on the show as I'd like to, and you have uh, no doubt your own unique history in terms of coming to uh, grips with these ideas. Uh, how long, how old is the Libertarian Alliance, of which you are the, what's your official title? I am the director. You're the director. So how long has that been around? Uh, The Libertarian Alliance was established at some point in the late 1970s. There is some dispute as to when it formally came into existence, but um, I think we can say 1979. Certainly, I joined it on the second, on the first, sorry, on the last Monday in December 1979, and it was sort of up and running by then. So uh, it's been around for 36 years almost. So it gets started uh, right around the time that there is, uh, I mean, really right on the eve of the election of Ronald Reagan in the United States. Mm -hmm. And of course, Reagan was very close with Margaret Thatcher. And it seems as though the the wave of electoral sentiment that gets her elected is an anti-union anti-state wave, even if it's somewhat ideologically confused, no doubt, is were you already a libertarian in these years in the sense that you already had everything figured out, or were you uh, observing current events and suddenly shocked into these ideas? Like, How do you fit into this picture? Oh, right. Um, it, I should imagine that in many cases it is possible to get hold of somebody And to present him with a set of irrefutable propositions uh, from which he will conclude that he is a libertarian. It's just that I've never come across anyone like that, and it doesn't apply to me. In my case, and in the case of those friends whom I've um, probed, libertarians are born. They're not made. Um, I have always been a libertarian in the sense that I want to be left alone, I don't care what other people do, and I don't like it when other people are pushed around by other people. Um, I think I, I, re- I began to realize I was a libertarian when I was 13. I, I read in close succession The Scarlet Pimpernel and 1984, and uh, I think both have had a great influence on me, but... Th- All they did was to confirm me in a set of rather inchoate prejudices that I'd grown up with. The, I suppose the epiphany came when I was 17 and I read John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty. And again, it's not, my experience of reading it was not to look up and say, that's a very clever argument. Yes, I think I accept that. My my response to Mill was to look up saying, yes, that is what I believe. Yes, that expresses exactly what I believe. Um, In retrospect, Mill's essay on liberty does not express exactly what I believed at the time, and it certainly doesn't express exactly what I believe now. But its generality is pretty good, and um, it didn't turn me into a libertarian. It helped me to realize that I was a libertarian. 
uh, some uh, a phrase that I use increasingly, and my friends have started to use it as well, is to talk about uh, when did you come out as a libertarian? Uh, and I think that is an entirely appropriate borrowing of terminology. We are not made. We do not become. We are. We're born that way. So was it during the Thatcher era that you, if we may use this term, came out as a libertarian? Oh, I'm far too old for that, Tom. I came out as a libertarian in 1977. That's two years before Margaret Thatcher was elected. Um, I, I believed in Margaret Thatcher for several years after she was elected. And no, let's go back... When she eventually got stabbed in the back in November 1990, I withdrew to the toilets in my current place of work and had a good cry. It was a terrible experience. Um, but that was not because I believed we had lost a great libertarian prime minister. I had stopped expecting anything libertarian from Margaret Thatcher or her government oh, for nearly, uh, nearly a decade before then. Um, I, I, I realized in about 1981 that this would not be a libertarian government. It wasn't a libertarian government. It would do a number of good things. It would sort out the unions. Um, it would sort them out in ways that I didn't necessarily like. It would, um, stop the runaway growth in government spending and cutting government spending is always a good thing. It would, um, it would deregulate in a number of very useful ways. Um, and so there were many positive things about the Thatcher decade, but libertarianism was not among them. Uh, but if you want a knockdown argument, when Margaret Thatcher came to office, you could get a gun, and because we're not on camera, I can't snap my fingers in your face, but if you could imagine that being done, you could buy a gun like that. Oh, you had to go, you had to go and jump through a few hoops. You had to go down to the police station and get the forms. You had, to, um, you had to pay a few pounds for your license and so on, but you could get a gun, no questions asked, and there was no particular fuss about gun ownership. It's just not something that um, most people wanted to do at the time. By the time she left office, we had something approaching our present system of um, wholesale victim disarmament. It was almost impossible for ordinary people to have um, guns, uh, and to keep them for any kind of defense was a decided no-no. Uh, now, if you, you know, I think that is a pretty good test of whether the Thatcher government was in any sense libertarian. It wasn't. Yet in the United States, she continues to be held in extremely high regard by the official American conservative movement, which, by the way, doesn't mean a whole lot. If I were held no. in high regard by that movement, I would wonder what on earth I had done so dreadfully wrong. But she, it, she has the same kind of aura about her that uh, Ronald Reagan does, it, it seems to, and, and, and it seems for largely the same reason, that they— they were both uh, good speakers, and sometimes they could speak quite eloquent, uh, eloquently on the subject of liberty. But when you look at the actual record, it's quite disappointing. Uh, what would be your first—I mean, uh, suppose somebody said to you, but look, the fact is that it was very, very difficult to slow government spending up, up to that point. There was nobody talking about doing it. The unions were completely— completely run amok in the country. I mean, these are not small achievements. You don't get everything you want, but you libertarians always expect perfection. We hear this argument all the time. How do you answer it? Well, let me um, put the other side of this. <clears throat> it was a Labour government in 1976 which cut government spending by 10%, 10% across the board. The only time since the 1930s that this has been done, we're not talking, all Margaret Thatcher did was to slow the rise in government spending. Her cuts were, were cuts in projected spending. She didn't reduce the uh, amount of money taken by the government. She didn't reduce spending. Whereas in 1976, as I said, it was a Labour government that cut spending by 10%. 
It was a Labour government in 1976 which dumped the um, dumped most of um, Keynesian demand management and brought in monetary targets. It didn't run it, it, it didn't um, run these targets terribly well. <clears throat> but then again, um, you're dealing with techniques of monetary management which were still being made up. It was it was a work in progress. Uh, and so uh, the idea that Margaret Thatcher uh, unleashed a, a revolution on this country is um, somewhat of an exaggeration. Now, there were positive things. I don't deny that. But let, let's turn back to the unions. Um, most companies in this country were not paralyzed by union activism. Union activism was a serious problem in the state sector and in those formerly private companies, British Leyland, for example, which was effectively owned by the state but which had shares listed on the stock exchange, in those companies um, where there was extraordinarily bad management. The... Um, it, any company with a strong management which was able to reach out to the workers did not, on the whole, suffer from union disruption. Oh, there was secondary disruption. If the, um, if the railways were on strike, it meant you couldn't send um, goods over the country. But uh, the idea that there were predatory trade union bosses going from uh, small and middle-sized businesses up and down the country, just shutting them down, that again is something of an exaggeration. Um, and what Margaret Thatcher did to the unions was a very bad thing in libertarian terms, and it was a very bad thing in the long term. What she did was effectively to take a set, was to take a series of private voluntary institutions and to nationalize them. The, the trade unions suddenly found themselves subject to very close regulation by the state. Now, perhaps this regulation could be defended on the grounds that it gave a voice to dissenting members, but um, it was an effective takeover of the trade unions by the state. She also unleashed a process by which the trade unions ceased to be run by ordinary working people and were taken over by the, the new class, the cultural Marxists. Uh, back in the 1970s, you, you, the, the trade unions in this country were run by people who had left school at 14, got jobs, and worked their way up through shop stewards, um, area organisers, central committee, etc., etc. Now, nowadays, the trade unions are run by middle-class graduates who are much more interested in... Um, who are much more interested in clamping down on homophobic hate speech than in getting a, 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 a good deal for their members. Uh, and so I am very sceptical uh, about the Thatcher myth. One of the reasons she's so popular in America is that whereas she was at the very least an ambiguous libertarian, she, she was a... Um, she was a hard and fast neoconservative and she believed passionately in the American alliance. Um, I'm not a neoconservative and I've always been rather dubious about the American alliance. But uh, of course she's loved by American Republicans or some conservatives out there because she was, she was their woman in London. I've sometimes wondered what people in other countries, particularly in your own, think not only about the United States government in particular, but also about their own relationship to that government. I can understand why Americans, as you say, admire Thatcher. I don't so much understand why, unless they're buying into some kind of mythos, there would be British people who would say, yes, it's a good thing for the British to ride in train behind the Americans and to line up behind their interventions and be their lapdogs. I mean, wouldn't this, wouldn't this rile a British patriot's soul? always has mine. Let me say something about the American relationship. Um, 
one of the most obvious one of the most obvious things um, one of the most obvious truths w- w- one of the most obvious and undeniable truths is that England and America uh, share common origins we share a language we share a whole range of assumptions and there would always be to some extent a special relationship let me give a personal example I was in Czechoslovakia at the end of the Cold War for a couple of years, um, working in Bratislava, doing various things, mostly political and economic advice, uh, and legal advice, mustn't forget that. Now, I was, um, I was out there with, um, I was, uh, there are only a few English people out there. I found... Well, what we all found was that the English and American people in Bratislava coalesced into a single group with common interests. We went to dinner. uh, We went to dinner together. We we worked together on close terms of friendship. And if we fell out, we had long arguments. Um, We didn't mix very much with the Germans, the French. Um, I mixed quite a lot with the Slovaks, but most didn't. And uh, this is a common experience. To say that we are foreigners to each other in, in the same sense as Americans and Mexicans or English and French is absurd. We, we're obviously not foreigners. The, the point is, Tom, that if, um, if you were to look me in the face and tell me an untruth, I'd know that you are lying because you are not a foreigner to me. I understand the tone of your voice, the the inflections, the reservations and so on. Now, uh, that must always count for something. But um, on the other hand, we need to bear in mind that um, we are also rivals. The, The idea that there is no difference in our interests is an absurdity. As far as, I think as far as the Americans are concerned, and it's perhaps rather um, presumptuous to try psychoanalyzing an entire nation that I don't visit very often, but so far as I can tell, Americans have always somehow resented the continued existence of England after 1776. The, the idea was that... Um, the British government had fallen away from the uh, libertarian achievements of the 17th century civil wars and revolutions, and that the torch had been taken up now in America by the colonists who had not forgotten the lessons of 1641 and uh, 1688, and that um, the whole the whole legacy of English history, Magna Carta onwards, had crossed the Atlantic and was now firmly at home in America. And so it, it was always, in the 19th century, a, a source of some resentment that England or Britain remained a great and powerful and very rich and dynamic country. And um, the decline of Britain in the 20th century was very useful to uh, American self-respect because it meant that uh, increasingly Britain could be ignored. Uh, You could go your own way and we would have to go with you. Now, looked at from our point of view, yes, there is much the same. You split away from us, you disappeared, and uh, perhaps we were rather glad to see you go. And then in the 20th century, due to the lunatic foreign policies of our own government, we found ourselves in your pocket. And um, compared with most foreign overlordship, I have to admit that um, American hegemony has been very gentle where Britain is concerned. Uh, the the American state, sorry, if um, if some South America if some South American government gets seriously on American nerves, 
bad things are done in those countries. Um, the American government will murder people, it will bomb people, it will invade, it will declare sanctions, it will do all sorts of deeply unpleasant things. And these foreigners will be reminded one way or another who is the boss. Where England is concerned, the Americans have always the Americans have always treated us with kid gloves. They've always deferred to our most um, to our most precious um, self respect feelings of self respect. I, I can't complain. The American overlordship has been much more gentle than Soviet overlordship would ever have been, or indeed German overlordship. But it is overlordship, and it does rankle slightly if you are a British or an English patriot. Well, let me ask you this question. What possible advantage would the British derive from egging on the United States or being part of the the war in Iraq I and mean, being part of spinning the web of lies about the war in Iraq? I mean, it, it, I can understand what the U.S. government's own motivations are, but what possible advantage would the British gain from this? Um. I think that was the vanity and stupidity of Tony Blair and a few of his friends. I was passionately, some say insanely, opposed to British um, joining in the Iraq war. However, I'll tell you this. If Tony Blair had gone to Washington and said to George Bush, we'll give you whatever you want, we'll give you total unreserved diplomatic support in the United Nations. We will do whatever it takes to get everyone else on board with this war. We will join fully in the military invasion of Iraq and we won't ask any questions. We will back you up to the hilt so far as we can. In return, we want this. We want you to we want you to hand out all of these high-tech contracts for the American military, and we want them to go to firms in Cambridge, in Basingstoke, in, in Birmingham, and London, and so on. I'll get you the figures for, for the amount of money that's going to be spent on these contracts. We want a 40% share of the rebuilding contracts for Iraq. We want you to re-equip our armed forces for us. Oh, and we want exactly the same open access to American technology and everything else that the Israelis have. Uh, uh, oh, and we want a free hand in Ireland. Oh, and uh, when we leave the European Union, we want to be invited into NAFTA and we'll join on our terms. You know, g give us this list of things and, you know, we're in. We, you know, we'll send the entire army to Iraq. We, we won't worry about the deaths. Now, if Tony Blair had got that deal and come back to London, I would have said, hmm, OK, I, I don't like the idea of it, but um, it's a fair exchange. That's the way of the world. Instead, he appears to have gone to Washington and said, please, George, please, can I join in your crusade against evil? What do you want me to do? Now, you know, what, what a complete wally the man was. Um, we could have used that to considerable effect. I feel rather guilty when I say it because it means that we would have joined in rather more enthusiastically than we did in uh, the destruction of a country and the murder of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of non-combatants. But uh, since that was going to happen anyway, I suppose we might have got something out of it. My objection to British involvement in the war is that it was immoral from the outset. It, well, it was immoral in all sorts of ways, not least because there seems to be no plan. There seems to be no um, plan for what happened after the defeat of the Iraqi armed forces, but also because we got nothing out of it, nothing at all. Indeed, I should imagine that uh, many Americans are, are actually blaming us for having urged them on to this lunacy, because that appears to have been the case. Tony Blair was pushing and pushing and pushing for war with Iraq. George W. Bush wanted it for his own purposes, but Tony Blair's support was very useful. And as I said, it was immoral in itself, and it was also to no national advantage. We're a great, I'm a libertarian, but I'm also a patriot, and where great national advantage is at stake, 
I, I may harden my heart when it comes to morality. Let me ask you a completely unrelated question, but that I'm very curious about. As a historian, I am acutely aware in the United States of how the textbooks and the standard manner of instruction in U.S. history lead the students to think a certain way about the state and its benevolent uh, intentions. And we get a story that runs something like this, that when the United States was more decentralized, there was injustice everywhere and impoverishment everywhere. And before we had the regulatory state that we have right now, well, of course, we know everybody was was dying in the streets and there was poverty everywhere. But thanks to intervention by the government, well, we, we now have less discrimination, we have less racism, we have uh, more social justice, we have uh, the – and so on and on, right? There are all these mm. different myths by which the current regime is justified. And I wonder what form does this take in the British case – uh, what what are the myths that, that are in the textbooks in the British case? Is it the same kind of thing? Um, nowadays, yes. Uh, but do you see, we had a revolution in the 1990s. It started before the election of the Labour government in 1997, um, but it was certainly consummated uh, while Tony Blair was Prime Minister. When I was a boy, the legitimizing ideology of the British state, yes, let's use that phrase, the legitimizing ideology of the British state was that um, the state had always existed, which is a probable truth, and um, it was, and that since British civilization was uniquely good, whatever had been done by the British state was itself good. Oh, occasionally we may have um, made a number of mistakes. Perhaps, um, you know, perhaps in retrospect, our dealings with Ireland were, were, were not entirely as one might have wished them to be. But, um, you know, we, you can always trust us to do the right thing in the end. Now, that was the legitimizing ideology of the British state. And uh, again, I may disappoint you in saying that um, it's a legitimizing ideology to which I very seldom dissented or with which I very seldom disagreed. Um, since the 1990s, possibly since the 1980s or 70s, it's always hard to um, locate the, the tipping point in these intellectual changes. We've taken a much more American PC view did you, for example, watch the opening ceremony of the of the Olympic Games in London? I did not. Um, you're lucky. I, I was in Bratislava when I watched it, and I preferred not to watch it, but my in-laws demanded that I should watch it. Um, what you had there was the new ruling class narrative. The past, before the 1940s certainly, and perhaps even later, the, the past is a dark time of capitalist exploitation and racism and sexism and homophobia. But gradually, starting in the early 20th century and with a great push after 1945 and culminating in the present generation, we have turned ourselves about and become a softer, gentler, kinder, more moral nation, uh, so much more politically correct. So that is what you know, that, that is the current legitimizing ideology of the British ruling class. It's exactly the same as in the United States, or what, you know, making a few changes for local circumstances. But then you see, since the nineteen sixties, I should say, Britain has become a cultural satellite of the United States. Um, a, a, a cultural satellite in a most astonishing way. <clears throat> and so, of course, um, everything that happens in America, every intellectual development in America is copied in this country. Uh, for example, in the 1980s, a, a group of lunatic American social workers began talking about satanic child abuse. Are you familiar with that? I am, yes. Yes. Um, it came here. 
it didn't develop here, it was imported here. Political correctness is an American import. Um, this general obsession with child sex is an American import. Uh, most bad things that happen in this country are American imports. And the few American imports which are good, well, they don't seem to get here until um, much later and in a much diluted sense. For, for, for example, in America, there is a very strong constitutionalist and libertarian movement. It may not be a very effective movement, but it's very large and well-funded and diverse. It has no counterpart in this country, I'm afraid. I was wondering what it would be like to be a libertarian. I mean, first of all, I mean, just being a libertarian in the United States in 1977 would be tricky enough. I can't imagine how uh, isolated it, one must feel in the UK in 1977 as a libertarian. But the other, the other thing I want to ask you about is I'm curious to know how, especially these days, how do the textbooks treat the subject or, of, or how are the students taught the subject of the British Empire? Are they taught that it's overall, was overall a force for good, uh, apart from the imperialism stuff, which is a, you know, sort of the nature of the game? I mean, are there people who say, well, the uh, you know, the British Empire, like the Roman one, did spread law and civilization where it went, or is the view instead that uh, British imperialism was without a doubt a net minus? My my sense is that the PC view would hold, and then that the conservatives, who just instinctively want to oppose every PC view, have now rallied to British imperialism, and so everybody's taking the wrong view. Um. Every so often I get invited to universities to defend the British Empire and I always produce gasps of horror and astonishment when I roll out a very traditional conservative defense of the empire. I won't go into it now, um, but it is a very traditionalist defense. Um, but to be honest, the current legitimizing ideology of the British state is divided on the empire. On the one hand, yes, we went overseas, we conquered all of these peoples. We, um, in Africa, for example, we deprived people of their land so that it could be um, given to white settlers. We forced um, tribal peoples into a cash economy. Uh, we um, we imposed cash taxes on them, which meant that they had to um, start um, commercial farming for cash to get the money to pay their taxes. And the commercial farming was, of course, highly advantageous to British companies, which bought, which bought the produce. And uh, you cannot conquer and run an empire on sweetness and light. And, and so the politically correct one part of the PC narrative on the British Empire is that it was an utterly evil thing. On the other hand, there is no doubt that um, it did introduce things like um, the rule of law, freedom of speech, um, due process of law, um, modern science and education. And so the, politi the politically correct classes in this country are rather divided on the empire. They don't share my um, view of it, which was, which is that it was a glorious adventure, and I'm rather proud of my ancestors who took part in it, though their part was rather um, menial, I might say. But um, it is possible, it, it is within the bounds of accepted discourse in this country to make a defense of British imperialism. You, you need to make large reservations about it and apologies all over the place, but you can still just about defend it. Uh, where I differ is that I refuse to apologize. I'll say, just because we're already over the time I pledged I'd keep you, I, my own view, one of the factors that I would bring in is that I don't see how the average Briton, leaving apart the, the peoples we're talking about around the world, but I don't see how the average Briton is benefited by this. I mean, certainly not economically. I could get through ordinary trading channels. I could get all the products that I need. I could get my products purchased without having a formal empire. So what do I, apart from national pride, gain from all this? Well, that's a good point. The empire was not, um, it was not economically advantageous to us. Um, 
the economic statistics are rather telling. In 1914, our biggest trading partners were Germany, the United States, and even Argentina. Indeed, our trade and invest, our investments in Argentina dwarfed our investments in India and many other places. And it would be, it's very difficult to find um, an economic, it's very difficult to find a mercantilist defense of the empire. But you have put your finger on it, national pride. I, I can tell you that when I look in my old school atlas published in the 1920s, my heart still swells with pride when I see that great mass of red ink over the map of the world. Not a very libertarian thing, and it may not even be a very rational thing, but the idea that uh, we conquered and for a very long time ran something like a quarter or a third of the world is uh, some source of pride to me and, and even consolation for our present degraded state. Yet when I look at the news when there's some U.S war going on, and they've got little American flags over every foreign city that's been bombed or taken. I look at that, and I'm just mortified, humiliated. I, I want to hide somewhere. I don't want to be confused with these people, especially when I travel abroad. I'm not like these people, is the message I want to convey to everybody I meet. Yes, well, if you'll pardon a certain bluntness of utterance, when we conquered our empire, we gave them the rule of law, and we, get, we put down widow burning, we put down piracy, we, we put down um, religious-based um, banditry. We gave them railways, we gave them modern science, we gave them the English language. And we were there for a long time to make sure that they paid attention to these things. When the American government um, decides to do something, it, it just leaves... Um, it just leaves a slag heap reeking of human blood. Uh, and so there is a difference uh, of nature between British and American imperialism. It, it is difficult to feel any pride in American foreign policy achievements since the end of the Second World War. I suppose, however, you could feel some qualified pride in the... Um, in the salvation of Germany and Japan after the Second World War, they were put together, they were patched up rather well with American money and um, with American ideas. But American policy in the Middle East has not been a resounding success, has it? And American policy in South America has often had rather questionable effects. Well, indeed. Let me give you a minute, though, to... Uh just round things up by telling us about the Libertarian Alliance and what it does. The Libertarian Alliance is an educational charity. We have been um, recognized by the tax authorities as a charity for tax purposes. What we do is we put the case for life, liberty and property. Um, we argue for free markets, the rule of law, and, oh, the usual libertarian package. We, we do not um, try to, we, we don't take part in electoral politics. We've never done that. Our mission is to, our mission is to explain the libertarian message as well as we can and also to raise up a, a generation of younger activists who will continue putting the case for libertarianism once we are retired and dead. And we hope that they will regard their mission as to raise up another generation uh, until such time as circumstances may be more propitious for a return to a more libertarian world or perhaps for progress towards a, a more libertarian world. You can either look back into the past and say it was freer then or you can look forward and say we want it to be free then. But whatever the case, the present is not a notably libertarian time to be alive. Well, the website is thelibertarianalliance.com. I will link to that, to your own personal site, to your Twitter, to books of yours. Uh, everything we've been talking about related to this episode will be available at tomwoods.com slash 362. Sean, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. 
Thank you for having me. And that's the show for today. TomWoods.com slash 362 is the show notes page. Tomorrow we're talking about seasteading. Yes, that's right. I have finally decided to talk about seasteading. I think it's an interesting subject. I wasn't so sure about it at first, but when I was on a uh, cruise ship not long ago with Bob Murphy, we were openly speculating about it, saying, well, look, we got everything we need here, basically, except high-speed Internet. You figure that's only a matter of time before you get better uh, quality Internet service on a cruise ship. So anyway, we're going to talk about seasteading tomorrow. Sometime before the month is out, i got to schedule, I, my gosh, I'm, I'm so scatterbrained lately, I have to schedule the monthly Q&A session that I do at Liberty Classroom. In addition to the courses, which are all recorded, you can listen to them or watch them whenever you want to. We also do a live session every month where I bring a few faculty on and we take questions. So we'll do Austrian economics one month, we'll do U.S. history one month. I think this is the U.S. history month. I think i got to call up Gutzman and McClanahan and say, hey, you bums, get on here. People got some questions. So that's always fun. And so if you belong to Liberty Classroom, please watch for my email that you'll be getting from me, giving you the details about when that's coming up. If you're not, now's a good time to join us at libertyclassroom.com, coupon code SHOW in all caps, Get you a discount. You can learn the history, economics, and philosophy we didn't get in school, but you can now get from professors you can trust. And plus, yes, we do record the live sessions, too, so you can listen to those at your leisure if you prefer to do that. But really, where's the fun in that? What's fun is being there with us while we do this, because we have really good rapport, the three of us, when we do these U.S. History Months. It's always fun, uh, these, these live sessions, so keep an eye out for that. And I guess that's all I have to say to you guys for today. So tomorrow, prepare yourselves. Seasteading is coming your way. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.